All right. Good afternoon. I will be uh, presenting some of the best of my rather considerable collection of original film that I found online uh, showing people social dancing um, and its films dating from the first couple of decades of the 20th century with a little bit from the end of the 19th. Um, the intent here is to step beyond what can be learned from dance books uh, and other written sources of time and watch people actually moving to the music. Uh, since these films were silent, I have added music that looked like it matched the tempo and phrasing of the dances. Uh, in most cases, this music has been from original recordings from the time. Uh, in using original recordings, I think it helps establish the films as artifacts of the time, a dance of 1915 with music from about the same time. Um, I've also found that original recordings usually work best with the process of trying to sync the action um, on screen with the phrasing of the music. Uh, even the best modern performances um, of period music often have subtle differences in tempo that make the process a bit harder. And in some cases, the result has been striking with moves that looked a bit disconnected in a, in a silent film suddenly falling into place when synced to the right music. Uh, also in the case of the tango, the entire sense of the music in 1914 is very different from a tango of say 1930, and certainly a tango of our present day. A tango of 1914 only really makes sense when paired with the music of 1914. Um, there is an amazing amount of material out there now on, uh, on YouTube and the internet archive and some wonderful film archives that have made much of their holdings accessible online. What I am able to show now while sitting in my, uh, able to, what I'm able to find now while sitting in my living room, um, just a few years ago would have required traveling physically to archives in places like Washington DC, San Francisco, Stockholm, Moscow, Berlin and such, tracking down delicate original films reviewing them on site and then paying to have copies made. Even with unlimited time and money, what I've done here today would have been impossible until very recently. Uh, interestingly enough, much of the most useful material I've found, uh, films that are intended to demonstrate and instruct, are not from the US, uh, where most of these dances originated, but they are from Scandinavia. Uh, the Swedish Film Archive has been particularly helpful, uh, even in one uh, instance, posting a digital copy of a film from their holdings on their website when I asked them to, uh, very politely uh, in Swedish. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> yeah, actually, could I, hold up, could I get you to admit people? Pop up. I'm admitting to nothing. Yeah, right up there. Anyway, I just had to put my wife to work admitting people as they enter. Um, so let's see. Um, so, uh, however, the availability of all the sources has been constrained by uh, the advancement of the of film technology at the moment these were being made, at the moment that film was being invented, uh, motion pictures were being invented. No matter how accommodating an archive might be, if a film doesn't exist, there's not much to be done. Uh, my earliest clip from the 1880s is in fact not a motion picture, but a series of stills that I animated. Um, and uh, then from the uh, 1890s, I have some Nickelodeon materials, very brief films. Uh, at that moment in time, motion pictures were a novelty and weren't really trying to tell a story. Uh, they were either of the, hey, look at this train arriving in a station, or look at this street scene of Paris variety, or they were highlighting performers like vaudeville dancers. Um, fortunately, since the cakewalk was a vaudeville staple, as well as a, a ballroom favorite at that moment, we have some cakewalk material dating from right around the turn of the 20th century. By 1908 or so, filmmaking uh, was maturing, and I start finding more narrative materials, uh, visual storytelling, that sometimes features people dancing in the background or foreground. The stuff I've found uh, this early has been European. 
It's been French, it's been Swedish, it's featured waltzing principally, though in one German case, a polka. Um, as uh, the teens begin uh, during the reign of the turkey trot, I've found stories with plots and characters, comedies and dramas um, that sometimes feature people dancing. Uh, the available sources expand drastically as the teens go on. Uh, many classic silent films from that time are now available online for me to quickly scan for moments of dancing. We also get uh, those Scandinavian how-to dance films I talked about. I found one in uh, Sweden that was clearly an unfinished project with sections in no logical order and scenes that belonged together were separated. Uh, but it was almost uh, half an hour with very clear footage of dancers showing every move they knew for a one-step, a foxtrot, a tango, a hesitation waltz, and a mashish. I found similar raw footage uh, from Denmark and Norway. I also found a film from Sweden, which we will see some bits of later, that was intended to shock people with examples of the naughty sort of dancing that would get you chucked out of a respectable dance hall. My own theory on this is that audience in remote Scandinavia were feeling a bit left out and wanted films to let them know what the cool kids were doing in America and Paris and such. Americans didn't need such films. They could just go down to, to the dance hall if they wanted to see the latest turkey trot variation. So, um, On to the dances. The cakewalk uh, was a fad of the turn of the 20th century, but faded in popularity by the teens. As far as partner dances, the dance of the moment to dance uh, to the exciting new ragtime, it was the dance of the moment, um, to uh, dance to the uh, new exciting ragtime music uh, being pioneered by African-Americans like Scott Joplin, what, <clears throat> that dance was the two-step. Unfortunately, at this moment, the film industry was still testing the waters with very short subjects. And if film of people doing the two-step has survived, it hasn't been put anywhere I've found it yet. Maybe someday, the search continues. The footwork of the two-step, the left together left and right together right, is well known and persisted all through our era, well into the 1920s and beyond. Uh, what we lack though, without the film evidence, is a sense beyond what we can infer from written sources of the spirit in which these steps were done, the affect of the dancers and any spontaneous embellishments they might have added. Uh, for the two-step of the early 20th century, we do not have visibility, the same visibility we do for the next generation of ragging dances the, uh, from the turkey trot era. We can infer a lot from what we see people do it, uh, doing in two steps in the following decade and beyond, but it'll be nice to have some evidence directly from the time. The two-step was the first of what were called back then, often by people who were objecting to them, the ragging dances. This is a class of dances in 4-4 time done to the popular music of the time. Uh, this includes dances by the name of two-step and then turkey trot and then one-step and then foxtrot, as well as an infinite list of novelty dances and moves. At uh, particular moments in time, specific steps or holds or stylings are in fashion, but the dancers had the option of doing whatever they liked. You could and will see dances, dancers on the same floor at the same time doing very different things. So you have the two-step as the ascended dance until later part of the aughts, when the turkey trot takes over as we get into the teens, then around 1913 or so, owing much to the influence of Vernon and Irene Castle, uh, the one-step becomes the dance du jour only to be quickly replaced by the foxtrot uh, in 1915 or so. There were clearly changes in dance fashion over time, as you'll see, but the change from the turkey trot era to the one-step era to the foxtrot era doesn't mean a sudden break or fundamental change in what people are doing to 4-4 four, four time music. They might well be doing what they were always doing or doing something very similar with a minor alteration, but just calling it by the fashionable name of the moment. The real dance, the dance here is the ragging dance. And all these other dances, be they two steps or turkey trots or grizzly bears or ways of dancing that might not even have a name are just options, alternative ways for you to participate 
in the great ragging dance that's happening out there on the dance floor. I will also discuss waltzes and the very distinctive styles that were spawned in the ragtime era. Styles that are often barely recognizable as waltzes to people with a contemporary or perhaps Victorian notion of what a waltz should look like. Then we will have the tango at its, the moment of its birth as an international rather than a regional dance, uh, which will also look very different from what you see today. And finally, we will have the mashish, uh, which is the predecessor of the modern ballroom samba, though with some examples you may have, some of the examples, you may have a hard time seeing the connection. Uh, whenever possible, I will try to not just show the fancy steps of the dance master, but snippets of what regular folks might be dancing. Sometimes this is in the form of actual footage of a dance hall. Often it will be movie storytelling with dance in the mix, with the assumption that in most cases, a director would simply ask the extras to dance and the principals, and they did the dances they already knew in the way they already knew how to do them. Uh, I've also tried to track down examples of the sorts of dancing that had these self-appointed guardians of public morals up in arms. Uh, so, the cakewalk. Uh, the cakewalk uh, originated as satire. Uh, it was invented by African Americans with the men often equipped with top hats and walking sticks and the women with parasols. Um, and uh, uh, parading up and down in a mockery of the manners of, uh, of the uh, wealthier white folks. Uh, then in the 1890s, the white folks either didn't get the joke or didn't care. Um, and, and it found its way into fashionable dance programs. It went particularly well with the style of music that was competing with ragtime for popularity, the marches of John Philip Sousa. Uh, the cakewalk was essentially a grand march, but with a difference. The leader, uh, which could be a single person or a couple, would set the step and the path for everyone to follow. And then there would be also a, an, ample opportunity for individuals and couples to show off. Uh, it had uh, several distinctive steps, one of which a kick step was taught to later generations by a frog singing, hello, my baby in a classic cartoon. Uh, while the cakewalk faded in popularity as the first decade wore on, I think it had an important impact. Along with ragtime music, it normalized the explicit, unambiguous incorporation of African-American influence into popular culture. Uh, the 20th century started as it continued. Most innovation in popular music started with the black folks. And while the white folks were riffing on what they'd been given, the black folks were off inventing the next new thing, be it ragtime or jazz or swing or rock and roll. It also normalized undignified silliness. The dancers having shaken off the constraints of Victorian decorum and their cakewalks were ready to embrace a style of partner dancing that flouted social convention and wasn't afraid to be sexy or downright goofy. So here we have some cakewalks.
honey, oh my honey, let me take you to Alexander's grandstand, brass band. Ain't you coming along? Come on in here, come on in here, Alexander's ragtime band. Come on in here, come on in here, it's the best band in the land. They can play a bugle call like you never heard before, so natural that you want to go to war. It's just the fastest band, what am honey lamb? Come on along, come on along, let me take you by the hand. Up to the man, up to the man, who's the leader of the band. And if you care to hear the Swanee River play in ragtime, come on in here, come on in here, Alexander's ragtime band. And that is the cakewalk. Um, now we get to the ragging dances, um, uh, which I've already discussed briefly. As I mentioned, I haven't found any uh, film examples of it uh, during the first half of the 20th century, uh, of the first decade of the 20th century. Not because it wasn't happening, but because filmmaking hadn't reached that point of uh, um, uh, had not uh, reached the point of uh, properly documenting it. So our film journey with the ragging dances begins in 1912, when the, uh, when the family of ragging dances were generally lumped un under the name of Turkey Trot. I am not going to say that they did this, um, that they uh, did this, whether it was a true Turkey Trot or not, because uh, I don't think there is such a thing as the true turkey trot. Uh, I think the definitions are a little murky. I've read several descriptions that do not agree with one another of what a turkey trot is. Um, and, and they differ in fundamental ways. So I have to conclude that the name applies more to a particular spirit than to a particular step. Um, I think it was born when someone decided to introduce a little bounce into their two step. Uh, beyond that, the rest is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, those who disapproved of modern dance tended to lump anything of which they disapproved under the heading of turkey trot. Um, the rest I will cover as we go forward. Thank you. 
have liked that scene better if there weren't a bunch of people standing in front of the dancers emoting, but still it was uh, an opportunity to see a lot of different uh, stylings, uh, a sort of a two-step with a little kick. Um, and also at the same time, people, uh, uh, people walking uh, slowly to the same music that other people were hopping quickly to. So as I was saying, there's, a, there's never one way to do a ragging dance. Now, this is probably a good mo uh, moment to talk about the dance postures. Um, as I'm sure you noticed that uh, a significant portion of the people were not in your usual ballroom style hole with uh, you know, the, uh, the, the man's right hand behind the, the, the back and then the left hand um, extended out and with the lady's right hand, but rather in something like a hug or uh, just uh, something with both elbows bent. Um, this seemed to be, have been very much the norm um, in the, uh, in the uh, um, turkey trot era. So, uh, uh, but not the, not the only uh, possible way, as you saw, there were people in a more conventional hold as well. Uh, and this continues until about 1916 or so. And then it just seems to go away and you, uh, you, you see very little of it after that. But, uh, and what you do see, however, is a, a wide variety of arm positions of people in what, you, what I'm calling conventional, uh, often extended out uh, um, rather far. And you've got to wonder how they weren't constantly clotheslining their fellow dancers, uh, but there you go. And also, uh, uh, the al alternative to that, I guess, the way you don't clothesline your fellow dancers is to have your arm almost straight up in the air. But anyway, you'll see a lot of it. All of this allows a, uh, a dancer to define his personal style. Um, you know, you had your favorite step and you had your favorite stance. Um, also, uh, you see a lot of people in a very close hold, body to body. And you also see people in a frame where they're a little where their bodies are separated. Um, but the close hold seems to be winning. Uh, and by the 20s, it will be pretty much universal. So the next one we he have here is a Charlie Chaplin um, film called Tango Tangles. Um, and it's set in a dance hall, except there's not a single tango anywhere. It's all basically turkey trot um, with a lot, of, uh, a lot of sort of bunny hug holds. Um, and uh, it's interesting, it looks like uh, some, scene, some uh, shots are filmed in a studio and others are filmed in an actual dance hall while people, actual people are actually dancing. And also look for the, the, uh, uh, the floor manager. There's a guy in a suit uh, who is manhandling the dancers and trying to keep traffic moving. And uh, that, that guy was a, a regular fixture in most dance halls. Um, and he also had the, uh, the option of chucking you out if you behave inappropriately. <laughs> This is from uh, uh, footage from an actual public, public dance hall in San Francisco from about the same time. And of 
course, I, you could see that uh, uh, that that alternative hold was very dominant in that uh, at that time among you know not dancers in a movie, but regular folks in in San Francisco in a dance hall. Which brings us to the next big thing, the one step. Um, this is uh, this came in a, a 1911-ish. Um, usual definition of the one step is a dance where you essentially walk the music, left, right, left, right, left, right, uh, stepping um, generally on every beat, though you could also step on alternate beats. So uh, you could step on, uh, on one and three and so forth. Um, it was popularized during the teens by Vernon and Irene Castle, uh, who had their own distinctive version, the Castle Walk, which featured a very confident forward stride. Um, most dancers didn't cover as much ground when dancing as the castles did. Um, it contrasts with the two, the uh, with the two step, where your steps are in little couplets of left together, left, right together, right. And the turkey trot, which as I said was more an umbrella term uh, than a specific dance, uh, which could be danced as a two-step or a march um, slash one step, but with a kind of a bounce and often with that uh, that unusual hold. Um, the dance historian Richard Powers recently told me that he found a reference to a walking step. I think he called it the four step as early as the end of the 19th century. Uh, which would help reinforce a general sense that even before the one step was a thing, a lot of people were just walking to the music. Um, one of the things the castles are credited uh, with is doing is making the modern dance respectable. Um, their version of the of it is free of bounces, dips, hugs, pumping of the arms, um, and such, uh, and 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 a focus on a smooth affect. Uh, it also had the result of briefly displacing the umbrella term for ragging dances uh, with one step as opposed to turkey trot. Um, uh, so for a brief time, uh, when people were doing their ragging dances, they were doing turkey trot. They weren't doing turkey trots, they were doing one steps, uh, or at least the respectable ones were. I will, however, end this session with some decidedly unrespectable one steps. So anyway, here is some one stepping. <laughs> And uh, this next one is one of those uh, those Swedish films I talked about, uh, which uh, demonstrates a very uh, very clearly how to do many of the one step uh, variations. <laughs>
interrupt that there. It goes on for a while. The whole thing is on my YouTube channel if you want to see it. That's an interesting little clip there. You, people there, uh, uh, you know, as I said, regular folks are doing a combination of one steps and two steps. Uh, and also, unlike the same city two years before, very few of them are in those um, alternate dance holds, the, the hug-like holds. Uh, and almost, almost, but not all, almost all of them are in the more conventional uh, you know, right hand, man's right hand behind the lady's back, arm extended kind of dance holds. Um, anyway.
was interesting. The, the, the principal couple there were seemed to be very fond of a of the straight arm clothesline style uh, uh, dance hold, which uh, I'm surprised that they don't uh, consistently smack their fellow dancers. But that was an extremely popular way to dance. Um, but I think probably its inherent hazards are the reason it fell out of fashion by the 20s. Okay, now we get into the dirty dancing. Um, uh, the thing on the right there is, uh, is the Castle House, the Vernon Irene Castle's dance school. Uh, their rules, don't, don't wiggle the shoulders, don't shake the hips, don't twist the body, don't flounce the elbows, don't pump the arms, do not hop, glide, and avoid low, fantastic and acrobatic dips. Stand far enough away from each other to allow free movement of the body in order to dance gracefully and comfortably. The gentleman should rest his hand lightly on the lady's back, touching her with the fingertips and wrist only, or preferred with the inside of the wrist and the back of the thumb. The gentleman's left hand and forearm should be held up in the air parallel with his body, with the hand extended, holding the lady's hand slightly in his palm. The arm should never be straightened out. Remember, you're at a social gathering and not a gymnasium. Drop the turkey trot, the grizzly bear, the bunny hug, etc. These dances are ugly, ungraceful, and out of fashion. Um, anyway, I'm about to show you a clip that breaks pretty much all of those rules. Um, just a little tidbit: uh, the, a lot of this, uh, a lot of these dances were well. There's always people who are appalled by the dances the kids are doing today. And that was definitely the case in the ragtime era. There were many, many people disapproving of dances, especially before the, the castles tried to civilize them. Um, one of the, and many of the objections were just uh, unabashedly racist since this was, you know, in our nation's history, one of the most racist eras of, of the time. With uh, you know, we're, with one of the principal objections being that this sort of dancing was uh, um, what was caught was introducing Negro wildness into uh, innocent white uh, children, especially young girls whose morals would be uh, undermined by ragtime dancing. Uh, and uh, even though the White House officially denied it. The, the word was that the 1914 presidential inaugural ball was canceled because of a fear of turkey trot. Uh, anyway, um, the, uh, uh, the next one is actually uh, Swedish, uh, but it appears to be an attempt um, on the part of a Swedish modern artist to appall and shock conservative society with American style uh, dancing. And I think by that is, is directly inferred, um, Im directly implied African American style dancing.
Okay. Um, anyway, I've now, now shown you uh, very clear and explicit instructions of how to get tossed out of a respectable dance hall. So next came the Foxtrot. And I really will not get into the various origin stories of the Foxtrot because I don't think those they are relevant or provable. Um, it's a fascinating study in how a name can take on a life of its own. Uh, it began with a very distinct step, um, a one step with very short, quick, steady steps, dance in the balls of the feet. Uh, it brought back some of the bounce of the turkey trot, but a bit smoother. Um, the first, uh, the film uh, you will see uh, is uh, courtesy of the Danes. Um, the Foxtrot was at that moment, about 1915, a huge, huge hit with music publishers republishing last year's One Step as this year's Foxtrot without changing a thing. Um, and record manufacturers began that tradition of labeling absolutely everything that you could dance to that was in 4-4 time as a Foxtrot, a practice that continued into the 1950s. Uh, the first pressing of uh, Rock Around the Clock is labeled as Foxtrot with vocals. Um, the, uh, the crazy thing about it is that while people were starting to call everything a Foxtrot, many of them seemed to continue dancing pretty much the way they always had. Um, up through the 20s, the authors of dance books gamely tried to define Foxtrots as something different and distinct from the one step. But their definitions didn't necessarily agree with one another. And nobody seemed to be paying attention anyway. By the time, by the end of the teens, it seemed like Foxtrot had replaced the two step, the turkey trot, and the one step as the thing people called their ragging dances and then their jazzy dances. Um, so here are some bits of uh, Foxtrotting, followed by a film called. Foxtrot finesse, in which everyone seen, talks about foxtrotting, but they don't seem to be doing the foxtrot. So this next one, Foxtrot Finesse from 1915, um, is, as I said, it's all about the Foxtrot. Everyone, the only dance they mentioned doing is the Foxtrot, but they aren't doing what we just saw, at least not quite. Uh, there's a bit of bounce in a lot of, in some of their stuff, but there's also some smooth dancing. It's kind of, they're doing the one step, they're doing the two step, they're doing a bouncy Foxtrotty light kind of thing. But basically what appears to be happening is that everything they're doing is Foxtrot, whether it is Foxtrot or not.
So uh, this is a nice bit of documentation of, uh, of the, uh, the dominance of the name Foxtrot without actually much changing what, how people are dancing. A lot of that looked kind of, kind of turkey trotish, uh, and then some one step, and um, very little of what, uh, of, of what I found distinctly labeled as Foxtrot. Interestingly enough, the stuff that I've found that says, here is how you do the Foxtrot, is, has been from Scandinavia again. I don't know. Um, moving on. So now we move away from the ragging dances in 4-4 time to the waltz, a dance that has endured. It was uh, about a century old at the time of, uh, uh, that we're talking about. Um, However, during that century, it had evolved a lot and took on forms that are almost unrecognizable to people today um, uh, who might say, yeah, sure, I know how to waltz. And, uh... <laughs> So this is the uh, earliest moving image I've found of people social dancing. It's a, one of them. It's uh, not actually a movie as such. It's uh, a series of still images taken by special cameras and part, as part of a study called uh, on, on bodily motion called animal locomotion. Uh, this is one of three studies in dancing. This is the only one where the dancers aren't naked women. Um, but it, uh, it, it captures a general sense of the Victorian era waltz where the focus was principally on rotation. Which brings us to the modern waltzes. Um, the focus on rotation starts, uh, there is still plenty of rotation going on, but that's not the, the foundation of the dance. Um, and we're going to be talking about the, uh, the Boston and the hesitation, the new styles that emerged at the dawn of the 20th century, um, which in their fancy forms, uh, the forms as, dance, as demonstrated by dance masters, uh, would be barely recognizable as a waltz sometimes. Uh, they are also, while they incorporate rotation, really about walking. Um, I will show these fancy styles. But I also show clips that I hope give a better idea of how people were likely actually waltzing out there on the dance floor. So first, the Boston Waltz. Uh, this is a really odd thing to pin down what exactly it is. Uh, the first thing I'm going to show from 1908, it's a Swedish again. It's labeled as the Boston Waltz. You know, that's what the title card says. It looks like a Victorian rotating waltz. It, it just looks, you know, totally Victorian, totally 19th century. Um, <clears throat> then, from a few years later, um, we have a form of Boston waltz that is very, very different. Um, and uh, the term Boston waltz is still used today to describe. Um, a very different sort of waltz. And uh, it seems today that, it seems that for much of the 20th century, the term Boston waltz was a way of referring to an old fashioned waltz. Um, but uh, the, the details of what exactly was meant by Boston waltz vary considerably over time. Um, so uh, anyway, here is, the first of my Boston Waltz examples.
Okay. Um, you know, any anyone who has attended a Victorian ball would recognize pretty much all of those moves. Um, and but uh, now for something completely different, also a Boston. I showed a fairly long clip there just because um, for those of you who think you know how to waltz, I wanted to give you an, a, a, an opportunity to, to look at a completely different way of thinking about what a waltz is. And now we have yet another Scandinavian dancing the Boston. <laughs> begins with a kind of a processional. It's, it is not part of the Boston.
Um, and uh, that's, uh, as I said, yet another take on the Boston. It's interesting that, that uh, I've found this wonderful uh, raw footage uh, from Norway. Um, it's 1920 when all of these dances that they're demonstrating, this old dude is demonstrating, were a little out of fashion, but I guess, you know, Norway was not exactly in the mainstream. Um, now I'm gonna show some uh, clips of people dancing waltz in what I think was the simplified form of the Boston, which is to say, it doesn't have all of these, these dips and fancy steps and so forth. And the fundamental dance is you waltz by stepping on the downbeat. So, you know, waltz time is one, two, three, four, five, six. So on one, you step with your left, two, three, and four, you step with your right, five, six. Um, anyway, you'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah, so and while you're stepping, uh, the the trailing foot sort of comes up behind. Um, it doesn't remain locked on the spot. But anyway, um, and and you can also you know step uh, to walk to the uh, to the music. And here's some more examples. These are from France. Um, anyway, that uh, that is how I think Boston Waltz 
sort of played out in reality. Um, the more fantastical forms that I showed you earlier, I have yet to find anything outside of a dance master saying, and here is the Boston Waltz, where that sort of thing is actually happening. Um, I'd also, just as an observation, I'd like to point out that I would like to recommend that, uh, that one-step kind of waltz um, as, a, uh, as a, a very useful tool. Um, I, have, uh, I have used it frequently in uh, when I'm running a ragtime ball, I feel like I need to function as something of a dance host and make sure everyone gets to dance. And when some when I uh, bring up a partner, an inexperienced partner, and it's a waltz, I can teach her that waltz. The little you know hop from left to right on the downbeats in about a minute and a half. You know, provided she has a, a, a rudimentary sense of rhythm. So uh, even if you are the finest waltzer in the land. I would really recommend adding this sort of one-step waltz to your quiver um, for situations where you want to dance with someone who has not gone to all the classes. It's something you can learn, you can pick up right away. But uh, this sort of Boston style works for faster waltzes. Um, but then for the slower waltzes, we have the hesitation. So the... Um, Um, the underlying uh, music for the hesitation tends to be slower. Um, and there is a different fundamental step. Um, although I've actually seen people do the, the bounce from left to right in the hesitation as well. Um, with the Boston, people seem to end up walking uh, while stepping on the downbeat, the first beat in every three. The most common hesitation step appears to be stepping on every beat with a slight rise at the end. Um, of each each set of three beats. So, which creates a little pause, hence hesitation. Um, followed by the next set of three steps that could begin with, uh, begin a, a movement, a half turn, or going into, a, uh, into some other move. And we'll see that in a moment. Um, and then I will, uh, um, complete uh, this with an example of some ordinary Americans waltzing using that step, um, but leaving out all the fancy flourishes and tricky moves.
the next. with um, uh, with some very simple dancing is his students were not doing any of the tricks, not doing any of the moves, just doing that uh, that one, two, three, one, two, three step that I talked about. And here are some Americans doing that that step as well. Uh, it was interesting when I uh, found this clip, of course, it was silent. And uh, I, I initially thought, oh, they must be doing the one step. And then I counted the steps. And everything was in threes. And often, when you're looking at old uh, dance footage, that's the only way you can tell the difference between a waltz and a one step, and is to watch the phrasing of the uh, um, watch the phrasing of the dance. And the, the the waltz will phrase in threes, and the one step will phrase in either fours or will be just a continuous roll. They don't. The the, the uh, archive didn't. The Prelinger archive didn't know what the story was behind that, but they speculated that it was an amateur attempt at a dramatic film that was never actually finished. Uh, but they did film a scene of everyone dancing on the lawn and various couples having various crises. Uh, but anyway, there was that was the hesitation done as an ordinary dance. And again, this would be very easy to teach. Just teach people to walk in threes. Um, and then, you know, maybe throw in a few simple rotations um, and uh, changes of direction, that sort of thing. So uh, moving right along, it's tango time. Um, the tango arrived in Paris about 1912 from Argentina. Um, I've seen different stories as to how it got there. That's not really important. 
um, and it was taken up by Parisian Dancing Society. They took uh, whatever they got from the Argentines, passed it through the filter of ragtime dance styles at that moment, and it came out as a dance that doesn't look much like what we now think of as a tango. Um, at this point, Parisian tango, as it spread to Europe and the Americas, found its way back to Argentina, where it suddenly became acceptable for the Argentine upper classes uh, because it, had, it was now French and it wasn't just this lower class dance people did in brothels. Um, there is much debate over what is true tango and what has been corrupted by the French. Um, and I won't enter into that other than to say that what we dance today was significantly impacted by the dance culture of the ragtime era. So here are three examples of tango, uh, one from France, another from Denmark, and the third from Russia. And uh, the, the first uh, two are fairly tame. I include the Russian one, though, so you'll get a sense of what the people who were getting all worked up about tango were getting worked up about. This, uh, this scene and, uh, and the others to follow. I think it was really important that I put this to, uh, that I set this to the tango music of the moment. This particular uh, piece is called Argentine Tango from 1913. When I found this, uh, the original uh, film on, online, uh, the, uh, the soundtrack, you know, kudos that they figured out it was a tango but they were um, uh, playing Cumparsita, uh, which, you know, if you, if you know tangos, you'll recognize it. it's one of the, it's the standards. And it just kind of didn't make sense. You know, a, a tango with a modern sensibility doesn't work with the tango styling of, a, of the teens. Whereas when you hear it, hear the, the music and see the dancing, the two are clearly properly mated. Thank you. 
In this scene, by the way, she's a, a girl who's been corrupted by the big city. Um, and that note was from her lover. And she uh, laughs and her former lover. And she laughs and, uh, and has the maid give him a few rubles as he stands there on the doorstep. And then he shoots himself. And then right after this, she steps over his corpse and is on her way because, you know, corrupted by the big city, dancing naughty, naughty tangos. Uh, and this is the kind of tango that would get you tossed out of a respectable dance hall. Uh, one of the more interesting features, though, is that the only way for those moves to work is if she is leading them. Um, so interesting, uh, interesting take on the tango. So the mashish, um, the apparent uh, mismatch between how that word is spelled and the way it's pronounced is due to its Brazilian roots. It's a Portuguese word. The mashish is a predecessor of the modern ballroom samba. Um, it was popularized by the castles and was found in more sophisticated dance circles, but I doubt you'd see much of it in an, an urban dance hall. The final uh, clip uh, of the Mashish is from a Danish film, and I suspect it's probably what it looked like in practice, though everyone is doing the same move at the same time. I don't think that was necessarily a thing. <laughs> years this was actually the only example of mashish i'd ever ever seen um original mashish uh, but since then i have stumbled on several others uh which i will share with you and they're a little bit different uh they're not as fast footed um and a little more deliberate and uh, slow and deliberate <laughs>
there is the mashish. And now the novelty dances, which is something that often comes to mind as soon as one thinks of the dances of the ragtime era. What's interesting though, is that actual film examples uh, that are labeled as, those per, as a particular novelty dance are very rare. Um, I suspect that, uh, meant, however, that uh, many of the moves, especially the one we saw in the naughty uh, one-step video, actually had a name and were um, on the list of, of uh, inappropriate behaviors. Um, I found uh, three examples of novelty dances, which I'm going to show. Um, they are the grizzly bear, the Texas Tommy, and the aeroplane waltz. So the ragtime era is replete with amusing names for various dance novelties to include the animal dances like, well, turkey trot, foxtrot, bunny hug, camel walk. Um, this image here in, uh, that I'm showing uh, is a satirical dance program that lists some of the novelties of the moment. Uh, the card is lampooning uh, the fad from around 1913, 1914 for dance halls and municipalities to publish lists of banned dances. Uh, the most commonly banned were the Turkey Trot, the Tango, the Grizzly Bear, and the Texas Tommy. Um, we have a general sense of how these particular dances were danced, but we'll see the Tommy in a moment, and the Grizzly Bear. Uh, we've already seen the Turkey Trot and the Tango. Uh, but information can be very spotty for the hookworm wiggle, or the half Nelson, or the glad eye. Um, the thing about it is that we can't be sure if a name actually corresponds to a distinct dance, um, or to some move, or a short routine. Further, it's entirely possible that one name can apply to multiple uh, moves, and the same move could easily go by different names in different places because there was no office of, no centralized office of nomenclature control for dance at the time. Uh, further, some of them may not have even existed, but could have just been added to someone's list as a gag. Um, I think the vast majority of those banned dance lists, especially the ones from the municipalities, um, were not completed independently after exhaustive research but rather were copied from other people's lists, um, perhaps enhanced by committee members asking their children the names of dances they were dancing at the moment. Um, as an example, I did a bit of research on the Yiddish Gavot. Uh, I found two references in, liter in, uh, in uh, literature in good old Google books. Uh, and in both cases, the context from the context didn't seem to be an actual dance but a euphemism for kind of dirty dancing. Um, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't at some point, somewhere, one or more actual dance variations that someone dubbed the Yiddish Gava. Uh, it was chaos out there, folks. Uh, the first example is the Grizzly Bear, but it's a French film and they're, dance and they're dancing bears uh, only a little resemblance to what I was taught as the, as the Grizzly Bear. Um, it is similar, but not quite the same. Uh, the main feature it shares is that the dancers separate uh, up for a little bit and walk around funny.
Um, the next is the Texas Tommy. Uh, this is uh, uh, actually two clips from two different uh, short films from 1914 from San Francisco, found the, pre um, the, the Prolinger archive. I think they are associated. Uh, they bo both clips show uh, African-Americans uh, dancing and part of it is, uh, I'll show later actually, uh, and a part of it is uh, two different couples doing something that is identified as the Texas Tommy. Um, we're not sure, we can never be completely sure that the people who were dancing it called it the Texas Tommy and not something else. And we can't be completely sure that when the white kids were dancing something that could get them thrown out of a dance hall and calling it the Texas Tommy, that that's what they were doing. However, um, we do have something here uh, that, is, uh, that is labeled as Texas Tommy. This thing finds its way all over the uh, internet. It's very popular. Um, it's often labeled as, as, um, as old as original Lindy Hop or something like that. You know, it, obviously it is a, a predecessor of the Lindy Hop, but uh, that's not what people were dancing. They weren't dancing a predecessor of anything. They were dancing their dance, which was in the moment, perfect and complete and not a path to something else. But anyway, here we go with the Texas Tommy. one is not actually a ragging dance it's in waltz time and i've decided to leave the uh walter cronkite narration uh that was in the uh the clip that i swiped off of youtube this was called the airplane waltz For the landing, throttle back, gear down, nose high, three point landing. And now we've been looking at various couple dances. Uh, we are uh, very briefly. Uh, we're going to see a uh, an African American ragtime square dance, which is actually from the same series of uh, films that uh, the Texas Tommy came from.
outside fun. I got to try that sometime. It's all part of uh, the antenna being uh, to give you a sense that there were there was more going on than just what I what I showed you before. Um, this is actually a lie because I'm, I'm going to stick in the bonus, which is um, this is a music video from 1908. It was a synchronized uh, um, uh, gramophone record and film. Uh, and I include it because it involves uh, ladies in tight corsets and big hats dancing polkas. So there it was, and uh, it was almost perfect synchronization, except somehow he kept singing while he was kissing her. Quite a trick. Um, so let's see. Uh, stop share. And um, I, by the way, did not see your um, uh, your uh, texts while uh, the thing was going. I tried to read them and was informed that it made a little black box appear on the screen. So uh, uh, if you were telling me something uh, or asking me something, I didn't necessarily see it. Um, let's see, all right. Um, um, all right, a lot of this, uh, anyway. Um, Mostly it's just comments. Uh, so I guess I'm going to I'm going to take the risk here, and I'm going to let you unmute, um, and uh, and hope that there isn't some moron lurking out there to shout obscenities at us. 
Uh, so let's see. And I. So now I think you can unmute yourselves. Yes, we can. Thank you, Walter. You're a brave fellow. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any questions, comments? <laughs> um, okay, looks like people got to run. Anyway, um, I suppose that's, uh, if that's, uh, that's it. Um, there's any, if there's not anything else. Well, did, you, I, did you have a chance to go to the Library of Congress and see what they said on the hesitation step, Waltz? Uh, I, I, I've, I've, uh, I've, I've read, uh, you know, I, I, the Library of Congress has this one, for those who don't know, uh, it has this wonderful site um, where they have digitized hundreds of dance books going back, I think, to the 17th century. Um, and it is a, a marvelous resource. Um, but the, uh, the purpose of this exercise was, uh, was to rely entirely on visual sources, because I have frequently found that, uh, yes, and the question is, yeah, the answer is yes, I, I, I have looked at the uh, Library of Congress. Um, but uh, and I also have dance books that describe it. But the, uh, uh, as I said, the purpose of this exercise was to try to, uh, to, to go purely from visual sources because often they don't agree with what you find in the books. <laughs> and also books often don't agree with one another. Um, but uh, um, it's all, it is this, this wonderful privilege that I have as a historian of the dances of the 20th century that I get to see people actually doing the dances. A, a historian of the dances of the 18th century is reliant completely on, uh, on, on, on written sources and maybe you know paintings or something like that. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, anyway, uh, any other any other questions or? Yes, uh, Anj, what would you like? You, uh, you were talking about the cakewalk and kind of the, the that it originally came out of the black community and it was a, a sort of a mockery and that maybe white people didn't get the joke. When white people were dancing it, were they also mocking themselves or? Yes. So they are as silly. As they the, were absolutely as silly. That was the, that was the appeal of the cakewalk. Uh, I, I think it had a lot of the same appeal. Uh, if, if you've ever uh, looked at vi uh, Victorian parlor games, a lot of them are really stupid. And I think the, the, uh, uh, the appeal was that these very stiff Victorians had this opportunity to let, you know, let their hair down and do something silly. Uh, and I think the, I think the cakewalk may, may have kind of started as a parlor, as a Victorian parlor game, uh, where people got a chance to behave in an outrageous manner, um, and uh, um, and yeah, uh, the appeal of the cakewalk was its silliness and not its, you know, there was if you were doing a dignified cakewalk, then you you know you were doing it wrong. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. I had a different origin of the cakewalk. I understand that the blacks would do a quadrille-like figure. And then partially through that figure, they would do a little cakewalk. And then later on, the cakewalk grew to a dance by itself. And then, of course, it was noticed by whites who were imitating blacks, imitating whites. Yeah, um, right. Well, that's, uh, uh, but what I was, what I was uh, uh, documenting was that point at which it found its way into the mainstream, um, which was, uh, and, um, and of course, the, uh, uh, that's when we saw, because it was a popular uh, vaudeville thing, it found its way into those first pictures, those first moving pictures, um, with a lot of other vaudeville acts. Um, but it's, um, yeah, they, yeah, I know it, it. It it has a long history before you know 1895 or so, when suddenly it burst onto the uh, uh, the. Uh, um, the ballroom scene of, of mainstream America. Okay. Well, thank you very much for showing up. Um, we will now see if I was successful in recording this.